cut that? Perfect. Did I go through okay. to everybody? Well, what? Did it go through to everyone? The little announcement, the recording thing? I got it, yes. Okay, just wanna make sure. All right, I'm gonna shut up now. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Marianne Boretsky Peterson. I'm lead editor with uh, Rothenyalt Press. And tonight we're going to hear some awesome readings from, we have Matthew McGurk, Beth Mulcahy, and we will have uh, D.W. White joining us. So we're gonna start out with Matthew and he's gonna be treating us to some pieces from his hybrid collection, Daydreams, Obsession, Reality, along with some appear that only online, is that correct? That is correct. And then I kind of want to throw you guys a curveball, so I'm gonna go a little off script. <laughs> uh sorry Go <laughs> i have a tendency to do stuff like that i guess um so i won't be following the script exactly but uh it should be fun either way hopefully um i guess all good for me to get started or go right ahead okay cool all right uh yeah so uh matthew mcgurk um if you don't know me uh mcgurk matthew on twitter might be more accurate for how people know me uh, all right, so like I said, I sort of, um, my tweet earlier, I said I sort of wanted to share uh, some pieces, obviously, from the collection, uh, and I wanted to share some stuff that's been published online, and also a couple pieces that have not been picked up anywhere, uh, so you guys would be like the first people to hear them, which would be kind of cool, I think. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Uh, so the first one is from the collection. Uh, it's called The Chickadee Song. Uh, it was originally published in Birdseed. Uh, so here we go. A walk in the woods is gentle. Everything showered in dew and hues of green, picked out of leaves and grass by morning's first laces of light threaded through branches, silent except quiet footsteps across uneven soil. And I pull my sweatshirt tighter to keep out the cool air. A low grumble, not far off, is something misplaced. Grumble isn't quite right, though. Maybe more like a sputter or the choke of engines starting. I looked around, knowing the forest had fled here already, but how far had they come? Just grass and trees in the woods this morning. No bulldozers or dump trucks, chainsaws or excavators. My mind eased, but I heard the sound again and perched along the branch of an aged and wrinkled maple was a chickadee, but it no longer knew that name or the song that went with it. So that's the first one that was published in Birdseed. The next two are pieces that are still looking for homes. Um, so not yet published anywhere, not yet accepted anywhere, um, both recently written. Uh, the first one's called Morning Routine. I've tightened my belt loop by loop and brushed dirt from my shoes, mending my soles in morning hours. I've pressed my shirts with a hot iron smoothing out what was once wrinkled and imperfect. The days have a way of wearing on and the sun is often chased away by clouds and I wane as the light dims. Shoes, be uh, sorry. Shoes beginning to whisper bad omens, shirt etched with waves, belt falling loose, laces tripping me, tying themselves in knots. And I wonder how long before they tangle you up to. So that was that one. Next one, <clears throat> uh, Dropping Lures, also uh, not accepted anywhere yet. Uh, we rose to brush skies, his mind our watch. Wide-brimmed hats, strong coffee and hooked lures, still staples. Clear pond is a polished memory, excited eyes after 20 years still flickering in the early morning light. The ride was quiet, only the sound of the old truck's engine between us and the fishing equipment in the bed skittering around when we hit the corners just right. We shoved off after dropping the canoe in the water, sending wrinkles across the freshly painted pond. I dipped my paddle in, remembering how easy it was back then. Now it's thicker than I remember. The muddled waters of time, too murky to see that far. Still, as the boat waded through the ooze, and we dropped lines, not much had changed. The worms still wriggled with their new piercings. The fish still nibbled before biting the hook. 
and the water still reflected his eyes, a bright wink, unmistakable clarity. Let's see. All right. Um, the next one uh, was published in uh, South Booth Station. Um, it seemed like some people liked it on Twitter, so I figured I would read this one. Uh, it was based on a VSS uh, 365 prompt, so I don't know if anybody else does those, but um, they're sort of fun. They give you like a, a daily word, basically, uh, and this was based off of the one for New Year's Day, actually. All right, so this is Renewal. For some standing on the brink of abyss, swirling oceans below and angry skies jetted with lightning above, acceptance comes before the plunge. Here's soaked cheeks with hands fitted in clutching knobs, but acceptance comes. For some it takes stepping off the edge and plummeting to violent waves and shark rocks, sorry, sharp rocks below, a minnow in a pool of thrashing sharks. You'll resurface, dragging yourself bruised and bleeding from the maelstrom, still alive but wondering why. Renewal isn't a light switch to brighten all darkness or a perfect sunrise of pinks, oranges, and yellows from the rippling dark night. Renewal is accepting scraped knees and knowing marks outside the lines don't ruin the picture. Renewal is a wave, not the whole ocean. Uh, the next one, uh, also based off a um, v, uh, VSS 365 prompt, uh, and this one was published in uh, Discretionary Love originally. Um, this one's called Cold Waters. Cold Waters. Once fond after and reciprocated smiles, fingers braided like knots, strong and dependable. Time wears the rope thin and frays the end to tangles. Left love lorn, now imprisoned, running once warm fingers over cold bars. Only the rope in hand, no longer a place to anchor the ship on sandy shores. I'm waiting in waves that draw me in and out as the tide pleases, covered in barnacles, salt baked skin, and pruned fingers from staying too long. My senses numb to the lapping waves in the rocking ocean. What good is an old map with tattered edges and faded letters tucked in the corner of the hull when the ship is cast along by gales and tides, gliding through waters and letting them in through invisible cracks beneath the surface, charting new territory while sea levels rise in the belly, dragging it down inch by inch into the forgotten darkness below. Uh, then I thought it'd be kind of fun because um, I don't know how many people saw these. Um, I don't know if you guys follow uh, Mythic Picnic, I think it is. Uh, they do these like little tweet story things or they did um, from February, early February to early March. So I thought I'd include uh, these two pieces in here as well, um, in case a lot of people didn't see them. So the first one's a story, kind of like poetic story and the second one's a poem. Uh, the first one's called The Snowflake. Uh, snowflake cast in disguise, perfect points and traced edges carved by clouds, but like a snowflake falling in darkness, there is no sheen, no audience, but the moon hidden behind that bank of gray. Colors split clouds in the east and darkness is cracked by light in early morning, spilling yolk on the landscape. The sun pulls the remaining clouds from the sky and the snowflake continues to fall, reflecting a mirror spinning in that sky. Everyone looks skyward and sees the snowflake, a dance in the sunlight, storybook pages in front of their eyes as the day winds between sun and storm. The warmth that parades the beauty of the snowflake across the sky like a goddess throws rays at a still bed of white lying on the ground and soon the snowflake is puddled with all the others. So that's the first one, sorry. Next one, um, in a sense, maybe a little closer to home because it has sort of a teacher's perspective. Uh, so this one was also based um, sort of for a tweet story for a mythic picnic there. This one's called an essential question. A student once asked me, have you ever had someone close to you pass? I'd seen the paperwork and his mom was on a ventilator and had asthma and diabetes and hypertension. It never lost a parent, but imagine it's sort of like being a squirrel grabbing nuts for winter storage and filling the cavity, 
closing off the door, the acorns wedged just right so he couldn't enter, or watching a bird peck at the ground after being led on by the promise of seed, or the last polar bear sitting on the last glacier, or a spider setting her nest of babies down just to see them blow away. Yes, was all I could say. All right. Sorry, my formatting's like way off on this. I put it into a Google Doc to make it easier for myself when it was a Word document, so I didn't have to flip back and forth, but kind of messed up all the formatting. Um, all right. So the next one, um, sort of a really personal one to me, because uh, it was written actually in the hospital after the birth of my second daughter, uh, one of three poems that was like that. Uh, so I figured I'd include one of those. This one was originally, um, actually it was part of the uh, poets, um, poets thing they do, which is really cool. Uh, so here's this. This one's called Good Math. How simple the number one sounds, one to worry about, one to think about, one set of feelings to cater to, and no one to preen or prod. Two is shifting the focus of the number one, one to buy for, one to make smile, but two knit together into something better, a tapestry, the first stitches of a story. Three is a different world, a unit, a support system, the two catering to the one and needing the one, triangles of the strongest shape for good reason. The third brings new life, but pangs of the past, like rewinding a tape, but watching it with new eyes. How easy it is to take three and make room for another, like riding a bike after a few years, the muscles still remember and a smile creeps back to your lips, even after all that time. All right. Uh, then I could do um, a reading with you guys without including a poem that you guys published. Uh, so I figured I would pull one that a lot of people commented on uh, from a little ways back. Uh, this one's called The Woodstack. <clears throat> Temperature is dropping to the 30s tonight, and there's wood to be collected from neat piles, all stacked in sections, cords upon cords, seasoned gray like stone, or still holding the reddish or blondish hue, clinging to a youth of sorts. The basement is dark, dusty, and dry, but the outside air etches speech bubbles as I exit the house. I stare at the wood stack. It's menacing for some reason, not because there's some animal behind it breathing white puffs into the night air or because I'm afraid of diving splendors, but I read somewhere black widows like seasoned wood, the kind we have and the kind I need to warm the house on nights like these. I've heard they're the most venomous spiders, did that blood filled hourglass to signal their poison? A shout of warning, even into a night this dark. The eight legs working between splinter rings of wood are carving out a home in the missing knot. I know we need the wood, but in a way, I'm wondering if the oil will hold out or if I can go buzz down the ash tree in the middle of the night. I'm sure, the neighbors wouldn't mind a roaring chainsaw in the dead black of winter. I settle. Oops, sorry. So I'm burning a few pallets in the basement and figure I'll deal with the problem tomorrow when the blushing light has kissed the stack and chased off any spiders. All right. Um, so this next piece was the longest one I included. Uh, it's not super long, but um, it was the first, uh, first flash, what do they call it? Flash feature piece for um, Rough Diamond Poetry. Uh, so I was sort of proud of that, and um, I guess it kind of gives a feel of like where I grow up, well, and where I live now, I guess, too. Uh, so this one is called The Maple Stand. Uh, one of my first memories was peering out from behind a maple desk, which I always called the stand because of the eclectic collection of objects that littered it like leaves across the ground in fall. I remember the whisper from my parents, where is he? Where did he go? I never waited too long and I'd plod out from behind the stand and tell them where I was. There's something about hiding that makes you want to be found, at least at that age. I didn't really know much about maple or oak or pine or anything like that at three years old. That really began when my father took me out in the woods and pulled down the leaves of this tree or that one. He fanned out five pine needles and told me that was how you remember as a white pine because white has five letters like the needles. The maple leaf has sharp edges and points, but was easy to remember because we watched enough Bruins games, uh, sorry, enough Bruins playing the maple leaves. 
uh, to pick that one up without the science lesson. The opposite branches are a giveaway for maples too. He always told me, not alternate like oak. Pears are sweet on each other, like the sap, he always said. We tap the trees in the maple stand during the winter, sorry, waning portions of winter on a warm day where snowdrifts still clung to January depth, but the sun sang whispers of early April. We pulled the drill out of the dusty basement and stuck spouts through the furrowed bark. As the snow receded, we needed step stools to hang the galvanized buckets on spouts we'd placed a little too early. We both blushed when my mom asked about the stools placed against the tap trees. I had friends over in the slitting orange light of dusk and we played hide and seek in the woods. There were five of us from the neighborhood and we waited in the thick brush of a scratching bramble or climbed the low broken branches of a pine or sifted through the stand of maples hiding between the gray bark and setting sun. The game always got rough, but scraped knees and grass stains were nothing to go crying to mommy about. Two rough tags sometimes sent fists flying and gave discolored eyes and cold shoulders for a couple days, but eventually we all came back together and played. We were shamed for being the first found and always wanted to be the last hiding, making them call out all the, all the oxen free when we were younger, or I give up already as we got older. The fading shadows of the trees and moon forcing us to pull out flashlights, but the games continued well into the night with beams of light dancing across tree treetops. The rough bark of a tree and the warm soft skin of a girl was a contrast I could deal with in my teens. The scent of her perfume beat out any of the flowers that collected in the open parts of the property. Her skin felt like polished stones from years in a riverbed and her movements played like the wind through leaves on an autumn day. The moments between us forgot time and we always hoped for more. The maple stand was still a place for hiding, but now it wasn't from each other, it was from our parents. We forgot that we were still minors and not living out our lives somewhere near a coast with crashing waves or a big city coffee shop with buzzing voices and stream steaming espresso machines. We could only hold our distance so long before we heard a call from the house and another until we knew it was time the words reached our ears. We needed to go. Now only hand in hand, no longer clean to every part of each other. I learned to hide when I was three behind that maple stand and I'm still hiding. But now I'm not afraid to linger a little longer before peeking out. All right, let's see. Am I still doing okay on time here? Let's see. I'm not infringing upon other people's MI. Let's see. Um, I think I'll skip. I had one other flash piece, but I think I'll skip that. Um, so I've got two poems left. Uh, one I tend to always start with, uh, and I think I'll finish with that one. And that's actually the first piece in my collection um, called Crop Rotation. Um, but I thought I'd include this one because um, it seemed like people liked it. Uh, and it was pub first published in Thin Slice of Anxiety. Uh, so this one's called There's Always You. Uh, conversation is all it was, just letting you know I see this. Uh, we might want to watch it as you age. You know there's a history there, a history of ups and downs, history of hairline cracks. Wait, sorry, I lost my spot, unfortunately. Um, history of ups and downs, a history of hairline cracks just waiting for one to divide and form a fissure all can see. History of more needs than wants, a fixation on something, iron grip that won't let go. It was always you though, looking back, that's a constant. All the other things just swinging in and out, like that friend who needs a couch. Bad news is all they are, but there's always been you. Will I always be enough? Will I always be the greatest fixation, the greatest addiction, enough to fill your veins and leave you full? She paused, and then she asked the question that neither of us wanted to hear. What happens to you if I disappear? All right, and then last one, like I said, first one from my collection. Uh, this one was originally published in Outcast Poetry or Outcast Press, uh, like their poetry editions. Uh, it's called Crop Rotation. And another, I guess, one that's pretty close to me because it's sort of from the mindset of a teacher in a sense. Um, all right. So I'm not sure why I'm standing here in front of the class thinking about my vegetable gardens, but somehow it makes sense. Looking at Alex itching to get to the bathroom or parking lot for the next drag off a cigarette or cloud from his vape and wondering if that was his dad 20 years ago. 
Sarah wears long sleeves in the 90 degree classroom and I wonder what's hiding under them. Is this pain handed down from her parents or are those inherited scars seared in her mind as well? Watching Ray slap a tray over Seth's head in the lunchroom makes me think about his father and what kind of belt he might wear, passing down punishments that aren't deserved. In gardening, they always say crop rotation is key. Don't want the diseases to catch up with the plants season after season. I wonder if they're onto something. All right, um, so I guess that's all I had. I skipped over one, um, but I think I'm probably butting up against the time I told you guys. <laughs> that was really great. Yes, thank you, Matt. Thank you. So um, next up, we do have Beth Mulcahy. And she is going to be reading some, um, uh, what is it, a uh, collection of poems and hermit crabs, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. thanks Fantastic. so Go much. Ahead. Thank you so much, Matt. That was, is a very tough act to follow. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> um, and thank you to Roth and Yaw Press for, for hosting this reading. And thank you all for coming. Um, as Marianne said, I'm Beth Mulcahy. Um, in the last couple of years, I've gotten back into creative writing, having been an avid re writer in my younger days, but um, then getting away from it for many, many years. Um, so I'm glad to be back in the creative writing realm. It makes me really happy and you know, just brings me a lot of joy. Um, so there's a large writing project that I've been working on for the past couple of years, which is an historical fiction novel that's based on the lives of my maternal ancestors. And I mention it because a couple of the pieces I'm gonna read um, kind of have come out of my research for that. But I do also love to write poetry and creative nonfiction and memoir. And I really love borrowed form, which is what Marianne referred to the, the hermit crab. Um, so I've thrown in a few of those as well. Uh, the first piece I wanna read is a poem called I have something to say about potatoes, and it was um, published in Sledgehammer Lit last year. It's a culmination of my research and imagining that I did about the life of my Irish great-great-grandmother and the potato blight in Ireland of the 1840s that she was born into. So um, there are some literary magazines out there, as we know, with some pretty specific topics about which they seek writing, and I saw one that was seeking writing about potatoes. Some of you have probably heard of it, Taddy Zine. Um, and this really like intrigued me because I thought, you know, geez, I love potatoes, but like, is there that much to really say about them? And the more I thought about it though, um, and being entrenched as I was in my Irish history research, I thought, wait a second, I do have something to say about potatoes. So here goes. I love meat and potatoes, like a good Irish girl. The tuber ties of my DNA are deep and distant. 177 years and 3,500 miles away, my great-great-grandmother burst fighting into a blighted world from the womb of a woman married to an Irish farmer. Her earliest memories, watching her father work land stolen from his father. He was allowed to rent back from absent nobility. Watching potatoes, she helped dig out, turn poison and disintegrate to ash in her mother's hands. Watching her mother's tears drown clutched rosary beads. Watching her father look at her like the fairies made her a girl when he so badly needed a boy. Watching the cows march away at gunpoint to be sold for someone else's pocket, for someone else to eat. Watching her people disappear I'll take mine mashed with salt, butter, and milk, certified Angus beef on the side, and none of it for granted. Okay, so thank you. So my next piece um, was published in Full House Literary, and it is called The Shawl. And like the potato poem, the ideas behind it lived in my mind for a long time before taking the form of this piece. So this was a culmination of my most favorite memories of my grandmother who died when I was 11. Um, and I just love using borrowed form as I've mentioned. And I was inspired to use a museum placard form from a workshop that I took actually um, that was through Full House Literary did a um, 24 hour lit festival where they had a bunch of different workshops. 
So I happened to take this one that was sort of on the theme of like archiving memoir type stuff. So the prompt was to find an object meaningful to you and write a museum placard um, for it that tells the story of why it matters. The shawl, a placard in the museum of my mind. Grandma shawl, date and place of origin. The exact origins unknown. Ireland, 1800s. Copebridge, Scotland, early 1900s. Detroit, Michigan, 1950s. Westland, Michigan, 1980s. History, purchased, made by, or given to Anne Marie Devlin Menzies during her lifetime, 1915 to 1987. Given to Liz Noser in 1986 by its owner, described above, her grandma. Unearthed by Liz Noser from a Cedar Hope chest in Worcester, Ohio in 2021. Physical description, three foot triangle of black and white plaid trimmed with black yarn fringe, black wisps cast a pall gray on the once bright white squares. Tightly woven woolen weathered and coarse. It is believed to have once been soft. If you bury your face in it and breathe very deeply, you can still smell the woman whose shoulders it once kept warm. You get a hint of her perfume mingled with dust and cedar and it generates the way her little brick townhouse smelled like beef stew with carrots and potatoes on Saturday night and the fruity smell of bubble bath when the soap dish became a boat with plastic cowboys for sailors and she would sing, Michael, row your boat ashore. While you made the lead cowboy sailor, Michael, steer the boat safely to the edge of the tub. And the smell of Lipton tea with two sugars and jam toast in front of the late show with Johnny Carson. From an old fashioned porcelain cup and saucer from the old country, covered in pink roses and green leaves and the smell of Pond's night cream on her skin while you fell asleep holding her hand. Okay, so the next piece um, is called Queen Anne's Lace, and it was published in um, Alternate Root Scene. And um, this is basically me working through a lot of the feelings that come up um, for bringing her back to life um, through researching and writing her story. So when you write about characters, you have to live with them and you talk to them and you get to know them. And so when this is someone um, that you once knew and is gone, it's on the one hand, it's really lovely to spend time with this person, but on the other hand, it really makes you miss them terribly. So I'm fortunate enough to have loads of photographs of my grandma because her husband was an amateur photographer and she was his favorite subject, a fact which I absolutely love. Um, so I get to study all these photos um, while I write her stories and I can't know everything that happened to her and how she felt about it. And that can be frustrating, but um, what I don't know, I'm trying to imagine and create. So her name was Anne. So here is Queen Anne's Lace. Walking around the Arboretum under the hot, bright summer sun, taking pictures of flowers and trees, I saw Queen Anne's Lace and thought about what made you happy. When you were here, you were grandma, and we would play. I spy with my little eye. Now I see you, a beautiful young woman in black and white photos, jet black bone straight hair, curled to perfection every time. I spy someone I miss and I start to cry. I imagine your disapproving look, scowl lipped, shaking head, saying, don't waste your time. It's more than 30 years I'm gone. I see you hand me a tissue, feel your arm around me as you tisk tisk my tears dry. I still feel how it felt when they told me you were gone, like my insides gutted hollow, throbbing in dread. Bringing you back to life like this, I miss you in a weepy way, like wandering a cemetery crying for the dead. Driving home, the sky gets dark. Giant drops pelt the windshield until it's hard to see anything at all. I think about the photos, how they remind me what I can't know and I'm gutted all over again. You look love struck there, but so unhappy here, like you couldn't smile after your love died, but you carried on so many years. I wonder what we would have been if I had ever been more than a kid to you. You would have shown me how to grow things like the flowers we saw today. 
how to prune roses without getting stuck. It's raining too hard to get out of the car when I get home. You would say, keep your sunglasses on, even after the sun is gone. Don't make your tears a problem. Hold your head high and carry on. I spy with my little eye, stoicism in you, building up in me. So um, the next one was also published in Alternate Root Scene. Um, and this is actually the one that was nominated um, last year for a push cart, the push cart. So I, I like to participate in a, but by the way, it got rejected like 14 times. I'm not kidding. That's not an exaggeration before it got accepted and then nominated. So that was a nice surprise. But um, I like to participate in as many generative writing groups that I can fit into my schedule um, because I love them. Uh, writing to prompts with others that I find is really inspiring and fun. So one of the groups I do is called the Brilliant Writers and it's run out of California by Albert Flynn de Silver, who's a poet and a memoirist and a teacher. It's a really su um, supportive creative community and every Friday they have a prompt class, which anybody can pop into. Um, and this came out of um, a prompt from that. And the prompt was my heart is an upside down flame and you can't see it, but um, this poem is in the shape of supposed to be in the shape of a flame, sort of, so it's called heart flame. Upside down or right side up, flames can be touched but not held. I am trying to hold, <clears throat> I am trying to hand my heart over to you as an upturned dancing flame, gasping to feed on your breath, going and full, full fueled by the oxygen of hope, emitting palpable vulnerability to stamping out as it slips through the spaces between your fingers onto the ground at our feet, trembling to be trampled. I bend to scoop up the dying ember to save what can be salvaged before it dies out altogether to put it back inside of me where it belongs, safely upside down again. So for that one, I was, um, I was really trying to capture three different emotional states. Um, hope, upside down, um, up, the upside, right side up, the upside down flame represents vulnerability, but, but I'm handing it over with hope. Um, and then the second emotional state was heartbreak as it's handled carelessly and slips to the ground. And the third is resolve as I, as I pick it up and put it back inside again. So um, that's kind of where I was going with that. Um, so this next piece, um, Roth and Yaw Press published, it's called Inadequacy. This one was a lot of fun to write. Um, it's me being a little bit evil, like in a revengey sort of way. Um, so I, and I think it speaks for itself. So I'll just go ahead and read it. All right. Um, inadequacy. My old friend, it's good to see you again in spite of it all. Will you sit down? There's something I need to say. So this drink, it's on me. Hearts break all the time, I know. But there's this little cup of inadequacy that fills up a little more each time. So one has to pour it out before it overflows and completely floods out any belief in oneself. All those heartbreakers, they were wrong, you see. I couldn't see it before, but I can see it now. It was not I who wasn't enough in some way or too much in another. The lacking was theirs. In all those times, my heart was broken. My failing sense of self was abundantly revealed anew in every possible in all the reasons why it just wasn't going to work. For the ones with political aspirations, I was too unconventional. For the free spirits, much too normal. And for the artists, well, I just didn't get it. I was far too needy for the independent, too fickle for the loyal, too restless for the settled, too distracted for the devoted. And for the musicians, my mind was not open enough, but for the philosophers, so open that it was closed. And for the predator, my body was okay, but not compared to the model he was with before. And for the brains, I was just not smart enough. For those wallowing in their own drowning, I was not messed up enough to really understand, even if I wanted to. And for the up and coming, I was too unstable. For the cheerful, far too moody. For the glass half empties, too optimistic and too flaky for the irritable. 
too responsible for the hippies, too driven for the old fashioned and insufficiently ambitious for overachievers. And on and on, the drips of doubt filled up my cup of inadequacy. But now I'm pouring it into yours. So drink up, old friend, and you will see it really was you and not me. <laughs> okay. Um, this next piece is another um, hermit crab and it is called Help Text and it was published in Celestite Poetry. And it's another bo borrowed form and it totally dates me because it comes out of having gone to college in the nineties when computers and email were relatively new. And we used a word processing program called Word Perfect. Um, and it had a feature called the Make It Fit Expert that would help you fit your like term papers into the maximum page requirements. So I guess I always wrote too much because I remember using this feature a lot and wishing that um, it exists, something like this existed for our psyches, um, for our hearts and minds to make our lives a little bit more easy to deal with. So um, help text. To enable your ability to cope, click on the tools menu. Select the make it fit expert in the box that appears on the screen and select the options you are willing to allow to be adjusted, such as, Margins, mistakes, fonts, fears, spacing, sorrow, alignment, and justification. Click OK to make it all OK. Reformat and reframe, reframe your past in magical nanoseconds of squinting and squishing it all down to make it fit all on just one page in a manageable way. You can't do anything with what doesn't fit and you won't remember what you lost anyway, so just click Save. Close your eyes and take a deep breath. Click. Next. How am I doing on time? Am I okay? We good? Okay. Just have to tell me if I go on too long, I'll stop. I just have a couple, few more, I think. Okay, so along the lines of, of um, help and borrowed form, this next piece is actually forthcoming. I'm very excited in rejection letters lit. Um, and this is a, a letter I wrote to the universe, came out of a prompt. Um, and so I'm a lawyer by day and I have to write a lot of formal documents, um, letters, sometimes demand letters. This is my formal request to the universe for mercy. Dear universe, I am following up. I'm writing to follow up to recent events within the scope of your realm and to provide you with some comments and questions related thereto. I represent humans on earth. I know that you encompass all of space and time and their contents, including but not limited to all the planets, stars, galaxies, and any and all forms of matter and energy seen and unseen. As such, you likely are engaged with much larger matters than the woes of meager earthlings. I do not mean to appear geocentric, but here on Earth, our situation feels drastic and urgent. Humanity is frankly really struggling right now and needs a break. In short, Anything you can do to lend us positive cosmic energy would be greatly appreciated. I don't have excuses for us. We have done what we have done to ourselves, I know. But I still have to ask, is there anything you can do for us? Is there some combination of positive cosmic vibes you can send to earth to ease up on the fires and the storms, the tsunamis and the earthquakes and the violence and the killing and the wars? the deterioration of natural resources and the diseases and the suffering and the dying too soon, the anxiety, the fear, and the loneliness. Can the dial be turned up instead on sheltering and kindness and peace and love? How about healing and steadiness and helping and holding? Any extra inches of strength, resilience, or resolve? What about gentleness? Can we get more of that down here? I know we do not deserve your mercy universe, but I hope you will find it in your galactic heart to give it to us anyway, and that your mercy will serve as a lesson to humans to have mercy on each other. I have thoroughly researched the issue and can attest that technically mercy can be bestowed irrespective of whether or not such mercy is deserved. I hope this feedback finds you and is well received. I hope you will do everything in your power to make things easier for us as we have truly had about as much as we can take. Please do not hesitate to contact me if you have questions. I would be happy to provide more specific details. I can still be reached for now.
Thank you. Um, so I have a couple, of, um, a couple more, which are prose poems that are new and unpublished and out for submission. So hoping they'll get picked up. First one's called Watch the World Melt, Hear It Crash. Under the glimmer of just enough February sun glowing out of the pale, barely blue sky, we watch ice glisten into water as it drips wet from the trees like snow, like, a, like slow motion rain. We watch the world melt, though you remind me that it was never solid to begin with. We look at each other at the thunder cry of cracking limbs dislodging dangling icicles crashing down all around. We hear the world crashing, though you remind me that it was never not crashing to begin with. We watch the world melt, we hear it crash. Okay, and then my last one came out of an, um, another one of Albert Flinda Silver's um, Friday prompts. Um, which had to do with like um, hearts pumping peace and holding up the sky. So here's what came out of that. It's called resting heart rate. The hollow heart pumps peace rhythmically, contracting and dilating, pushing calm methodically against the flow of fight. Peace is the absence of disturbance, but it is not passive. Being the heart that pumps peace against the current of rage is as difficult as trying to hold up the sky, to keep it from falling down around us. We are weakened by our fear that someday it will, the sky, fall down. It keeps trying to crash down on us. We know it on days when it is thick with layers upon layers of deep, dark clouds in 3D glory that erupt into 4D with rain and sleet and hail beating down on us. That is the hardest sky to hold off, our arms tired and we are soaked through, but we still hold it all at bay because though it will drench us to our core for a while until we think we can't take anymore, it will stop eventually and the clouds will clear and there will be a sky that's easier to hold again, easier to live under. There are days that the sky fools us into thinking it doesn't need to be held off at all. Like it can just be, like we can just be. Days when it is just a painting of a specific shade of blue and artists spent hours of trial and error to get just right. And it has a sun in it, sometimes bare, radiant, exposed, and sometimes hiding demure behind white wisps of brand new cotton balls. We let our arms down then to relax at our sides those days, but we keep our eyes on it always, the sky, to see what it will do next, while our hearts keep pumping out peace, hoping that peace will echo off the heavens all over the earth. That's it for me, thank you. And unmute myself for a second there. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. that was awesome. And finally, our well, our final reader is uh, D.W. White or Dan White, um, and going to be reading to us from his uh, first novel, I believe. Yes, yes. All right. Yeah, Dan is fine. Thank you. Yeah, this is the Stony Brook uh, University Zoom, and I cannot figure out how to change my name from that terrible legal name of mine. So yes, Dan is great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, this is from my, I suppose my first novel, it's um, Deep and Query Purgatory. So it seems a little, um, I don't know, tempting, tempting the gods to call it my first novel. But uh, so it was my MFA thesis and it was um, my fellowship project. And like I said, right now it's in query land. Um, and so just a little bit of background. So, cause it's, it's sort of in the middle. Um, so it takes place in Santa Monica, California in 1994. And it follows um, this young woman, Elizabeth, who's 28 years old. And uh, basically her, it takes place over the weekend of her younger sister's wedding uh, in, in the Casa del Mar Hotel in Santa Monica. And um, Elizabeth, Elizabeth's mother and her parents are very traditional. Her mother very much wants her to get married to her fiance, Michael, and move back to San Francisco and have a family and, and have this sort of traditional life. And Elizabeth is not into that in the slightest, and she's planning to go to grad school and get a PhD in Victorian literature and culture and kind of have her own life. And so um, and that's, you know, kind of the, over, the overview. So the crux kind of the matter overall, and especially 
at the scene that I'm going to be reading from is, so her parents own her apartment where she's lived for 10 years and um, it's on the sea and she loves her apartment. Elizabeth does. And, and her mother is kind of threatening to sell it uh, as like a, a kind of a scare tactic or a, you know, kind of a pressure her into pressure Elizabeth into kind of acquiescence. And so this scene, like I said, is uh, about two thirds of the way through and it's um, on Sunday of that uh, long weekend, Sunday morning, and it just opens at uh, beginning of chapter one of part four is what it is. And so she, Elizabeth and uh, her dog, who's also her fiance's dog, Mercury, are checking out of the hotel. And her plan is to go and meet her father for um, breakfast. And her kind of hope plan is, is to get her father to kind of um, serve as something of an intermediary between her and her mother. And so um, I think that's all you need to know. I'm sure I forgot many things, um, unfortunately. It's the way it is. Um, oh, the, their last name is Wallace. So she refers to the narration refers to Mr. and Mrs. Wallace, and that's just Elizabeth's parents. Um, and yeah, and so I think I'll just start reading. And uh, thank you. Okay. Mercury, wise and stately, blinked slowly and declined brusquely the opportunity to once again relocate. Now from the respectable Castle del Mar Hotel back to Elizabeth's ostensible apartment, the first several times it was presented to him. He prided stability over all things, save perhaps broad sunlit uplands of plush carpeting upon which to peaceably lie. A sanguine beast, indeed. Elizabeth tugged at his collar as the clock ticked on, checked helplessly her bare wrist. Incredibly convenient that Michael had already left. Gotta get ready for golf. Nonsense. Elizabeth wiped the first bead of sweat from her brow, looking down at composed mercury. Life had become so congested, a birthday party to host, a cunning dog to coax, an apartment with a formidably new client to make in the afternoon. All, were, all well, Mr. Wallace sat at shutters, sipping orange juice thick with pulp, waiting on his eldest daughter and her retinue of dilemmas. Elizabeth struggled her way through dusty bones and clouded thoughts. The morning had certainly held more promise the evening before. Was it indeed possible that, despite her efforts in this very room, not 50 hours earlier, every titanic worry Elizabeth had spent, had spent the last few days, months, years, stuffing in the cemental broom closet, the monsters under the bed of one psyche, were real, out in the opening and demanding attention. For it certainly seemed that the night before would prove itself seismic before long. And yet Mercury sat, resolute. Elizabeth stood staring at him, considering her opponent. His ears hung like the ancient ivy off the Forest Hill house back home. His eyes screwed into a determined place. He was perhaps Zeus, rather Hades himself having lived for millennia with neither concern nor age, traveling at reserved pace from Olympus to Santa Monica, stone age to computer age, selecting choice slices of steak and patches of sunlight to call his own. Mercury lick, licked his nose and blinked. Hitting on a novel approach, Elizabeth turned, turned on a heel, flipped hair from brow to scar, zipped up her duffel bag. She looked once more under the bed, made a show of glancing around the front room and double checking the bath, humming aloud a simple rhythm, broadcasting bluntly in ease of mind. A furry ear perhaps twitched. And what would she do then, should those worst fears be confirmed? After the months of angst and self-reassurances, after the apparent relief she'd bathed in Friday afternoon, had she and Michael all at once grown palpably, irrevocably apart? It was possible that it had been nothing but idle talk, but things certainly felt different, in a pointedly Mrs. Wallaceian, in a decidedly un-Elizabethan way, now. And should that be the case, what to do? Elizabeth performed a last look. Would she be able to, after all this time, go it alone? Should it come to that? Everything had been so clear in her mind on the previous afternoon a hundred years before. Calypso coffee fueling newfound conviction. But now, hard against reality. Across the threshold, unsettling sounds, unmistakably Mercurian, came from the bedroom. Elizabeth peered around a wall and espied thrashing tail, loping through the air like a seabird, his body wedged beneath the armchair, the great cushioned thing rising considerable inches off the ground in time to create bursts of canine energy. He was so fortunate to never be hungover. Elizabeth grabbed her bag and turned the door handle. If he was indeed the lord of the underworld, perhaps he'd be good enough to find a quiet little place for her. Perhaps Hades had ample parking. On the door, the hotel map may have met her gaze, unblinking. It was downright impossible that everything had taken place in so small an area. The next 50 years, thrashed out in four days, a quarter mile square. She pulled the handle and made it a half step through before Mercury bounded out, muscling past with his leash trailing behind, 
wedging her against the door frame. In the hall, he stopped and turned to face her, expectantly. Elizabeth massaged her shoulder. What, man? We have to go. Mercury barked, softly and warped, the sound bending around some object set fast between imposing canines. Elizabeth took a step closer. Certainly, there were no defenses vermin for Mercury to slaughter in the stately rooms of the Castle del Mar. Certainly, one hoped. Charon perhaps worked overtime. As she approached, cautiously, Mercury sprang, sprung from thick legs to close the distance between them, landing his paws on Elizabeth's shoulders. Hot breath flooded her face like mustard gas. What a place to die, the deserted hallway of the finest hotel in Santa Monica, a mortal dog pawing at fresh corpse. Elizabeth steadied herself, bracing for the tattered remains of a mouse to be spat at her. Simply lovely that Michael had left. She gathered up her constitution and opened her eyes. Mercury remained at eye level. Peering into his mouth, she found no disemboweled rodent. Instead, he had her watch gripped between his teeth, fine leather on lolling tongue. Holy shit, she said, contorting her free arm to come up between his paws. He dropped the watch into her palm and hopped down, tail whisking against the wall. Elizabeth examined it, none the worse for wear, clasp intact and glass smooth. The time was even true. Mercury looked up at her patiently. Elizabeth flipped an ear into place. Thanks. Mercury took up his leash in his mouth and led the way out. Elizabeth pulled the door shut and followed him. She checked the time. Checkout would have to be swift. Elizabeth and Mercury stole around the side of the Casa del Mar, up the slight incline. She found herself ducking slightly as shutters squatted across the sky sidewalk. Mr. Wallace perhaps peering over jet black coffee to discover his eldest, so terribly old, daughter in surreptitious lockstep with lumbering canine. At the corner, she wrapped his leash around one of the parking signs her father sound, found so fascinating, making a haphazard nod. Just stay here, okay? Mercury looked at her skeptically and barked. Elizabeth spun to the front door. The lobby was crowded now with fervent weekenders. How many people there were, people that one never saw, doing every way possible, displaying pleasant, displaying pleasant, unaffected faces, shaded by hats or accessorized by pearls. It looked so easy from a distance to be one of their number. The elevators were in demand as Elizabeth made for the desk. How was your stay? Asked the clerk, riding up an obituary to pass her a seat. Just fine, thanks. She switched her bag from forearm to shoulder. Fine, indeed. Which of the exhaustively researched Castle Lamar customer satisfaction criterion encompassed mother's welding propriety like a sword, fiance's covering up large swaths of the past like white collar crimes, age coming on like a biblical plague? Yes, well, I didn't see any place in the comment form to indicate general life implosion, so I wasn't quite sure. Elizabeth cleared her throat. Everything was great. The clerk dropped his 10 syllables on the counter like a bag of, bag of groceries. Glad to hear it. We hope you come back soon. Elizabeth waited a moment to see if the exchange had any other treasures of human interaction. Finding none, she turned to go. Mercury by now would have doubtless uprooted the signpost and made for the sea. Excuse me, ma'am. Elizabeth stopped, hung her head. Another clerk, endless clerks and endless whites, was walking briskly towards her full of purpose and poor visual judgment skills. For the fourth time in as many days, she'd been struck dumb with age. Are you Mrs. Wallace, room 616? God, no. I'm sorry? No, I'm Miss Wallace. Elizabeth, well, I was. I mean, I still am only, I've just checked out, but I was in 616, Miss Wallace. He nodded, non-threatening. Right, okay. Well, there's a message for you. Elizabeth, so clearly very composed and at ease with the world, studied her voice. What is it? The hotel men, and so bright was the whites of their shirts. Where do hotels find such excellent bleach? Handed her a once folded slip of paper, heavy with watermark, and turned sharp on a heel. Please call ASAP, a lawyer waiting for you in lobby. Won't go away, Jay Bates. Elizabeth folded the Castle Del Mar paper over her thumb like a bandage, working through the logic of Bates to her doorman. Lawyer, attorney, appraiser. Indeed, Mrs. Wallace struck with the cunning of a gorilla. With her apartment evidently under maternal siege by proxy, Elizabeth steered through the lobby to the phone. Yeah, hi there, Miss Wallace. Sorry to bother you around your trip. I know you said only to call an emergency, but I figured you'd want to know about. No, no, what's going on? I got this fellow here and he won't leave. Says he's got some appointment with you. Now I said to him, I know about all the appointments happening to Sandy Mount. And I never heard of any lawyer appointments today, especially any in Sandy Mount 7, with my oldest and most faithful tenant. I said to him, fella, I don't know who you are, but I'll go ahead and call over any. Right, right, Elizabeth said turning from the watchful eyes of indifferent passerby. It was best to slow any Bates monologue before it encompassed his entire day on my new, entire day in my new detail. He's an appraiser, right? That's it, 
That's what he says. I don't know what all he's fit to appraise, given the looks of him. Elizabeth exhaled. The parade thundered on. All right, I'll be home soon. She hung up the phone. Of all things, what would she say to Mrs. Walls? And how would she get home quickly without a car? She hurried back inside, through the lobby with its milling, sandaled patrons, and past the ancient doorman, tipping his hat so often it seemed rather quite nonsensical, really, to wear it at all. On the street, Mercury sat like a medieval castle on the Norman sidewalk, barking at pedestrians to maintain his wide moat. Elizabeth felt their astonished looks as she came up to him, fluffing his head and unwrapping his leash. He'd grown warm in the sun. She re-shouldered her bag, the strap, the strap wearing on her flesh. Mercury would simply have to come and tell Mr. Wallace that she had to go, that she had to not go to the breakfast she was going to, but the time wasn't there. She looked down at him, now swinging his tail against the metal pole, rattling it loudly as if to remind her of the time. Don't, you know, wreck anything, okay? Elizabeth lowered her head and centered her sunglasses as they neared shutters. Mercury was entirely unpredictable in such a setting. He would perhaps knock over diminutive waitresses. He'd perhaps help himself to a side of bacon off some stuffy couple's table. Perhaps merely find it he'd, he'd enjoyed it as much as Mr. Wallace and settle himself in the sun, refusing to leave. They loitered like delinquents, steps from the door keeping close eye on the host. The wind came right off the water, picking up heat and funneling it through the buildings towards the hill. One's hair was impossible to manage. Time ticking on, a praiser waiting, an enemy force in the depths of their home, no doubt offered subversive coffee, tepid and black, by Bates. Linger in the wings to avoid detection. Keep your eyes canines close. Find opening and explode. Go, go, Elizabeth said, whispering as the host turned to negotiate an utter crisis of seating arrangement. Mercury's gusto carried him ahead like Mrs. Wallace seizing a piece of society gossip, leash snapping firm and dragging Elizabeth into the restaurant with little of her own volition. Recovering her balance, she scanned for Mr. Wallace as the comments rose around Mercury's unflappable form. He stood by, grinning at each table in turn, tongue hanging out between massive teeth. Her father was, her father, her father was seated in the far corner, naturally, as near the water as shutters could manage. It was strange to see him alone, wrenched free of Mrs. Wallace. Only on the rarest occasions throughout their childhood had he stepped up to assist in battles that grew to become intraparental, to dispute, at times, Mrs. Wallace's most antiquated notions of hemlines and curfews. Miss Elizabeth had overheard him once or twice, remark on the phone and two ambiguous family members at stuffy Thanksgivings how demanding it could be, living as the only male member of the household. Naturally, no one saw fit to ask Elizabeth how it felt to be the only rational member of the household. All in good fun, of course. And yet here he was, alone and peaceful by the sea, drinking thick black coffee and suspiciously light orange juice. Mercury jolted towards him, trampling under paw all notions of discretion, and settled on the floor before either Wallace could react. Elizabeth had lost the leash and now considered seriously the idea of taking another table under an assumed name. Oh, why, hello there, Mr. Wallace said, breaking his gaze from the paper to peer amicably below. You haven't seen my daughter about by chance, have you? I believe you're acquainted. I'm supposed to meet her, meet her here, as it happens. Tall, rather perspicacious, generally carrying some book around. Mercury snuffed the ground violently and slapped his ears against his head. The table wobbled. The room docked. Hi, Dad, Elizabeth said. Sorry I'm late. We're late. Elizabeth, the prodigal daughter returns, as it were. Well, let's have a seat. As you can see, your graceful companion has found himself a nice spot. Right, Elizabeth said shoveling mountains of concealment over her chagrin and slipping into the opposite chair. She's a bit industrious. Must be why the two of you get along so famously. Now, a refill. He signaled towards a waitress standing with some beside himself manager, tossing heated gesticulations towards Mercury. I'll have another of these fine drinks, please, and one for my daughter here. Elizabeth put her, whist, her wrist with her watch on the table. Mr. Wallace thoroughly enjoyed the word daughter. Certainly, Mr. Wallace, the waitress said edging to the table and hushing her tone. We um, typically don't allow dogs in here, sir. Mrs. Wallace's smile raised his glasses a millimeter or two above his eyebrows. Oh, him? I'm not entirely sure what species he is, to tell you the truth. Countess Lupus Familiaris is certainly a leading contender. I dare say he's in a rather amicable mood, amicable mood this morning, however, fortunately for us. He offered a wink in Elizabeth's direction. This is my daughter, Elizabeth. She lives down here, can you imagine? Just down the road, I always say to her that I don't quite see how she managed to get any work done with, per, with this perpetually fine weather you folks enjoy. But she certainly does. She's quite the intellectual, you know. But we all deserve a moment's respite from time to time, I contend. 
And so I cajoled her to come down here to your fine establishment to breakfast with me, singing the praises of your excellent mimosa, naturally. He gave a small gesture towards his empty flute. The waitress opened her mouth as if, as if to speak, glanced over her shoulder to her manager, making a show of preoccupation, and said, um, certainly, Mr. Wallace, coming right up. Why, thank you. Elizabeth watched her walk away, su suppressing the embarrassment accompanying Mr. Wallace's low, wa low wattage flirtation. No, no time for qualms with the apartment besieged. That was quite the move, Dad. Oh, it was nothing, he said, slipping a hand down to scratch Mercury's ear. You know, people bring their little dogs and their little handbags, and not a thing is said about it. Of course, those creatures don't quite have quite as much menace as our friend here. Right. Well, actually, unfortunately, we can't really stay here very long. Mr. Wallace photos his newspaper at a haphazard angle, sliding his coffee cup to make room. What's this now? Elizabeth pulled her eyes off what's news and sighed. Before I walked over here, I got a message from my, well, he's sort of a doorman desk clerk type. Mr. Wallace tipped an imaginary cap as the waitress hurriedly deposited fresh mimosas. The eccentric fellow who never remembers your mother and I? Him, yeah. Anyway, he left me some message saying there's someone at my building waiting for me, some appointment, I guess. Elizabeth centered her mimosa in front of her and tasted it. The influx of vitamin C seemed to be sorely wanted by some elemental, elemental part of her being. What to say, precisely, now that the moment had arrived? Surely he must know, but to overplay one's hand, the conversation was an open expanse of treacherous water, all manner of unseen creatures lingering below to tumble one off the boat. What did he know behind his roughly folded newspaper and amicable expression, the now lukewarm aroma of coffee hanging around him, the sun slicing through the window to illuminate a sport jacketed forearm? It was impossible to tell. He'd worn the same expression, evidently, for the last 28 years. So I'm not really sure, but I probably have to go deal with it. Mr. Wallace smiled. Arch, would that be it? Looking around the restaurant a moment as if to indicate some well-hidden camera crew that the game was finally up. Old Lizzie here has finally figured it out, 10 years on. Ah, yes, that must be Stevenson, your mother's appraiser. That'd be the only way he'd come out on a Sunday, you know. Stevenson, our piano teacher? Mr. Wallace pondered Elizabeth's face as if it was a rare vermeer he'd hunted down in an obscure Dutch village. In some ways, perhaps it was. Was that the old fellow's name? I remember your sister hated those lessons terribly. What a coincidence. But no, I dare say I doubt this Stevenson is the same. This is some associate of your mother's. Elizabeth smiled thinly. Mr. Wallace was straying wildly from the point. Okay, well, like I said, I think I'd better deal with him. I mean, if he's an appraiser, Mr. Wallace had become engaged in breaking off pieces of bacon and slipping them to mercury, the table bouncing as he chewed. Elizabeth waited for her father's amusement to wane, drinking her, drinking her mimosa as Mercury's tail whipped back and forth against her shins. The majority of the room was now engaged in open revolt against them, affixing high society stares and exchanging towering looks. Dad, he's certainly a voracious one, our Mr. Mercury, Mr. Wallace said, now tearing a piece of toast in half with schoolboy glee. Look at him go. Dad, everyone's staring. Singular sounds of mercury and mastication blared beneath the table as a second slice of toast submerged into the shutter's underworld. We need to order a proper breakfast for this one. Perhaps a nice black forest ham. Dad, he really doesn't need the food. He'll just eat anything. He's not hungry. Oh, Elizabeth, don't begrudge our friend his simple pleasures. He's a growing boy. Mercury's nails scraped the floor with enough vigor to threaten the perilous fault lines below as he wrangled an English muffin into place. Mr. Wallace leaned over in his chair to get a better view. I say, he's quite efficient. Dad, Mr. Wallace straightened up, delighted. Yes, Elizabeth? Everyone is staring at us. Oh, bother them. And I was saying, don't you think I should go deal with this appraiser situation? Hmm? Mr. Wallace dropped a piece of grapefruit, apparently with designs on clandestinity from chest height. Oh, yes, this business. Well, now look here, Elizabeth. Your mother is very, well, she rather likes to do things she, that she decides to do. Carry it out, you see. What does that mean? Mr. Wallace smiled. Who can say? Great, thanks. All right, all right. Mr. Wallace took a drink and centered his chair. Your mother, I don't really know what she's about with all this business with your apartment, but I do know that, regardless of what she may feel about your uh, wayward path at the moment, she wouldn't much like the notion of selling anything at all that receives a poor appraisal. Elizabeth, Mr. Wallace looked heavily across the table. You catch my meaning, I trust. Elizabeth, overlooking wayward, leaned into Mercury's great back. 
You're saying I should sabotage this? Mr. Wallace pulled away, shaking his head. Oh, no, no, Elizabeth, never. I'm only saying that it would really be too bad for the portfolio, you know, if Stevenson noticed some of the more uh, less ideal aspects of your apartment. I seem to recall a light fixture, certainly a door, perhaps, that don't quite work as one might hope. Elizabeth ran fresh pulp around her teeth. How bold he'd become. Had he always been this way, running around creating schoolboy conundrums and slipping $2 slices of bacon to mythic dogs, possessing a levity hidden from Elizabeth by those imposing, if unlikely, of a, if unlikely allies, Mrs. Wallace and youth? I think I see what you're saying. Mr. Wallace picked up his affability from the place he'd set it down and waved to the wide-eyed waitress. Good, good. Well, you two better run along. I say we really didn't get a chance to talk. All right. Well, how about this? Mr. Wallace began, cutting himself off to turn to the waitress. Hello there. I believe my daughter and her strapping young walking companion are terribly engaged this morning and must be off. I, however, plan to sol soldier on. Could you bring me one more of these excellent beverages? Here he nodded to his champagne flute like one might an old friend of the funeral of a colleague. And see if you can't rub and jump any further newspapers. I seem to have exhausted the journal a bit early today. Thank you so much. The waitress glanced at Elizabeth as if to confirm reality. A poor choice, indeed. Thanks, Elizabeth said, sending her off. Now, Mr. Wallace continued, aren't you having some dinner this evening? Perhaps I'll stay an extra night and come along. Then we might be able to find a little corner of time to engage for ourselves. Elizabeth started, paused, started again. Well, yes, for Kelly's birthday, but then our lovely Miss St. John, splendid. We're having a bit of a, you know, party afterwards at my place for her. Oh, well, I'll come by there too. Birthdays aren't nearly as numerous as we might like, you know, best to mark them. Elizabeth finished her mimosa and began pulling at mercury. The identity of this person sitting across from her, ostensibly her father, but with none of the trappings of the Mr. Walsh she'd seen all weekend, all life, was difficult to determine. The conversation, however, still needed to be had. Indeed, now more than ever, with enemy and forces encamped at the apartment's front door. The plan was no worse than any other she managed. All right, sure. We're meeting up in Elopies at six. You know the place, I think, over by Michael's house. Indeed, I do, daughter. Mr. Wallace thought highly of the champagne and shudders. Elizabeth stood up and shouldered her bag. Okay, then, Dad. Thanks for breakfast. See you tonight, I guess. Mercury scrambled out from beneath the table with great zest for life, sending a coffee spoon clattering to the floor. The waitress step, stepped gingerly around him to set a fresh mimosa and LA Times on the table before speeding off. Till tonight, Elizabeth, Mr. Mercury. Oh, and Lizzie, Mr. Wallace lowered his voice and raised his eyebrows. I wouldn't let your mother somehow discover that a quadruped friend here stayed over next door all weekend, which I presume he did. And she might not care for such a revelation. He winked at the both of them and set to his fresh paper. Okay, dad, thanks, bye. Bye now. Mercury leapt up and placed upon Mr. Wallace's shoulder for a few seconds, tail thrashing maniacally, before leaping down and charging through the growing crowd and into the expansive patch of sun falling across the sidewalk. Elizabeth hustled after him, checking her watch. There was far too little time. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. Um, I am... I guess we can open the floor if anyone has any questions for any of our readers. Any comments? I guess there's no questions. No comments, we're all good. All right, well, thanks everybody for hanging out with us tonight. Um, we will be, as I said, we're gonna be posting this to our YouTube channel and um, we are planning another reading for sometime in April. We'll get that solidified a little more soon. And so I hope to see some of you back here for that too. Have a great night, guys. Thank you guys. Everyone have a good night. It was so nice seeing all of you. Come back and hang out again. Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah, thank you so much. <clears throat> Bye. Uh, let's see.